Um, let me tell you a little bit about our guests. Um, we've had the opportunity to to host these type of firesides several times, and it's just been exciting to have so many people attend. And it's been wonderful to have so many incredible speakers. So let me tell you about our speaker this evening. So his name is David Lindsley. He's best known for his paintings of Joseph Smith, which have been widely used by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. David has created several paintings that support the Book of Mormon setting in North America. He has been particularly interested in the ancient artifacts known as the Michigan Collection. For a number of years, David has been creating accurate replicas of some of the most interesting artifacts. David has also produced a number of videos and presentations that feature the Book of Mormon evidence. In 2022, David authored his first book, The Land Northward, which makes various connections between the Michigan Collection, the Smithsonian Surveys, and the Book of Mormon. So, if I could have you welcome David Lindsley. A photo of Joseph Smith. You know, there's been a lot of controversy about this photo, that photo. And so, I'm, I'm weighing in on, with my research and my expertise as an artist, you know, to tell you what I think. Okay, so that's how we will go. Okay, there seems to be a constant speculation about a photo of Joseph Smith and what he really looked like. Every once in a while, somebody comes up with like, oh, I, I found a photo of Joseph Smith. And, um, and so I'm going to present my research on the historical sources of what I found, and especially from my perspective as an artist. And you've probably seen some of my work over there. And I think maybe some of you, especially if you haven't seen my presentation before or online, might be a little bit surprised. So we're going to dive into this. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of photography um, and how it intersected with the life of the prophet. Now, since the 1500s, artists have, um, uh, have used a very interesting device called the camera obscura. It literally means dark chamber. And so a lens or even a pinhole on an enclosure would reflect an image onto a wall that they could then trace. Now, the image was upside down, that's no big deal, but it's also backwards. And so usually it had no uh, bearing on what they were doing. And so for centuries, artists want, used that and wanted to, a way to what they call fix the image. In other words, keep it permanent. Okay. So fast forward to 1839, and a Frenchman by the name of Louis de Guerre found a way to fix the image. He had a partner uh, by the name of Les, uh, Nespis, who had actually died, but he, Louis de Guerre proceeded with the, uh, uh, with the experiments and finally found a way to fix the image. And he made a de Guerre camera. Now I have a replica that I made in the back, which I'll show you a little later. And it's a large box that pretty much the same thing, you have a lens or in this case, yes, a lens in the front. And then in the back had a little silver plate it's about this big or this big, depending on, on what you wanted, that then would be photographically, um, uh, you know, capable of making an image. Now, the, the and then when this was just, uh, invented and presented, people thought this was, and it was, a miracle because an image could be made without any human hands. In fact, Daguerre called his little resulting photo a sketch. And the person who is operating the camera was called an artist. So Louis de Guerre himself was an artist. And so this artist would make a sketch. And so um, the problem is, oh, and they thought, oh, this is going to replace paintings. This is a replacement for paintings. And we don't need to do anything but, you know, take this picture. And the uh, problem is, of course, they're only black and white. And they're maybe only just this big maximum. And, and sometimes they got very, very small. And... Um, but, and, and there was no negative, and so if you wanted to copy a picture from a daguerreotype, you had to take a picture of the daguerreotype, which um, the quality just really went down, it was really bad. And it wasn't until many, many years later in the 1880s and stuff when they had negatives and paper photos and so on and so forth that they could, you know, make reproductions. And so, in the other problem with the daguerreotype, it took, the exposure time was 20 minutes so you open the lens, 
20 minutes later, you close the lens and they got your picture. And so because of that, it was limited only to buildings or still lifes, things like that. It was deemed impossible, impractical at the best, and pretty much impossible to take a picture of a person. But luckily, uh, there were processes improved upon, larger lenses, different chemicals, and so on and so forth. By the way, the very noxious chemicals used to uh, produce these uh, daguerreotypes. So eventually, the daguerreotype process, the, the exposure time, was uh, uh, whittled down to only just a couple of minutes, uh, maybe two or three minutes to take an exposure, which now became in the realm of, okay, if you sit really, really, really still for three minutes, you could take a picture of, 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 a, of a person. Here is the Daguerreotype camera and all the various associated uh, things that uh, in part of developing the uh, resulting photo. And um, Shirley, could you get me the little um, silver-ish plate over there? Both of them, the little one and the big one. And so the image was put onto a little silver plate at first they used silver, then they used copper, and it just coated with silver because it was a lot cheaper. And the plates look like this. They were, this is the full size with a, a silver coating, and this is just plastic. And then some of the other ones, they would, they would cut these things up because it was really expensive to do a full plate. So they cut them halves and quarters, six and ninths and, and twelfths and sixteenths to get maybe just a little picture right here and it was much cheaper. And um, they reserved the really full plate for really important things or big panoramic scenes or something like that. So it was a process that was improved upon quickly, but it was still a big deal to create a picture of, of things and especially people. And then after the photo was taken on the silver plate, then it had to be covered with glass uh, to keep the silver from tarnishing. It's just, if the silver tarnished, then your image is gone. And then, uh, then you put a little frame around it and put it in a little little case with a cover with a little hinge, and that was your daguerreotype. And I'll ha I have a sample back that I'll show you later. So that's the daguerreotype. And we have daguerreotypes, uh, early daguerreotypes of Abraham Lincoln. This was 1846, and Edgar Allan Poe in 1848, which looks like he hasn't slept since 1842, actually. <laughs> And we also have, for the Latter-day Saints, we have Parley P. Pratt. We have uh, Willard Richards. We have Brigham Young. And we have Emma Smith, taken after Joseph's death. Um, we have Oliver Cowdery, also after Joseph's death. And this is a much, um, much nicer. This is taken in the 18, late 1840s, maybe even early, early 50s. Uh, much cleaner, sharper image. And we also have Uncle John Smith. That was uh, Joseph Smith's uncle. So all of those people, was there a photo of Joseph? I mean, we had everybody else, right? Joseph was the most famous uh, resident in Nauvoo. Surely there must be a picture of Joseph somewhere. Well, there is. And how do we know that? There is a testimony, what I call the testimony of three witnesses. This is Charles W. Carter. This is, he was much later in the 1880s and he was a professional salt lake photographer um, that was uh, um, in salt lake city and by the way the word photographer and photograph those weren't coined yet that was that wasn't a word and so it was it was artist and sketch and anyway so charles carter was a professional photographer of salt lake city and he had an announcement in the paper that said the only correct photograph of the Prophet Joseph Smith copied from the original daguerreotype, okay, taken in 1843, it was actually 44, um, kindly loaned to me by Joseph Smith Jr. Well, it was Joseph Smith III, okay. So that's one. And then the second witness is Joseph Smith III, that's Joseph's son. And he said, it fortunately happens to us that the characteristic likeness of my father, that we know the characteristic likeness of my father by the daguerreotype in our possession, taken by an artist by the name of Lucian Foster. And we'll, we'll introduce you to Lucian Foster, who was not an artist, what we would call an artist. He was a photographer. 
And Joseph Smith, the third son, Israel Smith, said, we have daguerreotypes of both grandfather and grandmother. So the Smith family knows a daguerreotype was taken, or a photo, well, a daguerreotype, right? In fact, they don't say any other photo thing, they do say daguerreotype. So, now there's also somebody say, well, we, when Joseph Smith went to see President Van Buren in 1839, he probably went there to, and it was, got his photograph taken because the thing was invented in 1839. Well, let's see if that's even a possibility. So in August of 1839, Louis Daguerre introduced the daguerreotype camera to the world at a French technology fair. And, um, and it was just like, it was the greatest thing since sliced bread, right? And, um, and there was a little, and he had a, a little later, he came out with a manual of how to do it and how to make one, or you could buy one from him, or you could make yourself. And then that was translated in English uh, pretty soon. But Joseph went to see, uh, oh, no. So in October of 1839, this picture was taken. And it's again, it's one of these photos of daguerreotype that had took a long exposure time. It, it was outside, and it was a street in France. And I want to show you a quick little thing. This is the first known photo of a person this guy is getting his shoe, si shoe shined by a shoe shine guy. And it was still enough that the, uh, they got him taking the picture. So that's the first photo of a person. Then, now that was October. Now in December of 1839, Joseph went and saw President Van Buren. He was there for a few days, couldn't get anywhere. He was trying to get... Uh, uh, justice for the uh, the saints being driven out of Missouri. Okay, and, and Van Buren famously said, you know, your cause is just, but if I help you, I'll lose the vote in Missouri, so can't help you. That was just November, or December. And then in the middle of February um, of 1840, this is Henry Fitz. He is a telescope maker, and he makes lenses for the newly, all these new daguerreotype cameras. And he sat and posed uh, uh, for himself uh, with the Garretite camera. And he had, the exposure time was um, um, several minutes uh, that he took. Now, this is the world's first selfie. Wow. The world's first selfie. Now, he was in bright sunlight because he had to get as much light as he could onto the plate. And his eyes were closed. Okay. And there's the Garretite camera. Now, let's move forward to July of 1840, and this is uh, Dorothy Draper. And in July of 1840, Dorothy Draper was the first person to have a daguerreotype picture of herself with her eyes open. And the exposure time was just a couple of minutes, so she was able to uh, hold that pose for a couple of minutes. Beautiful, beautiful woman. Unfortunately, this plate doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> It got tarnished and somebody decided, oh, let's clean this thing up. Mm -hmm. oh. Wiped it totally off the glass, or off the plate. Yeah, but luckily somebody had the foresight to take a picture of it with a, with a real camera, probably in 1860s or 1880s or something. So did Joseph sit for a photo in 1839 in Washington, D.C.? No, he couldn't have. There weren't any even photographic studios at that time. So the process wasn't quite mature. He missed it by that much, but there's no way that he could have had a photograph taken. So, well, where was the photograph taken? How was it taken? Who did it? Okay. Now, in April of 24th of 1844, a man by the name of Lucian Foster arrived in Nauvoo. Lucian Foster was a branch president in New York, and he moved to Nauvoo to be with the Saints, and he had learned the art of making daguerreotype um, pictures. Um, while in New York, they have classes there. And um, and so he moved to Nauvoo in April, 1844. That's just two months before the prophet was assassinated, okay? Now, let's, let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about the artwork that was available in Nauvoo in the 1840s. This is Sutcliffe Mosley. 
he is an artist, a folk artist, and he made lots of drawings of the people, residents in Nauvoo, uh, to support himself and his family. And he did uh, drawings like this of, of um, what is this? Oh, yeah, it's uh, George Albert Smith, and then also Joseph Smith, and uh, Hiram Smith, and Bathsheba Smith, and many, many others. And notice they're all portraits, or sideways, okay? And then they're considered very accurate as far as the profiles. And how did he get it accurate? He used a tracing technique, which we'll show in just a minute here. Or maybe we will. Anyway, so here is here is Hiram and here is Joseph. And I want to point out to you that the, um, the all of Sutcliffe Mosley's drawings of Joseph and Hiram, they had different clothing styles. And Joseph always had the white collar up to nearly his mouth, okay, which was actually kind of a little out of style for that day and age. It kind of harkens back to the 1825-ish era. But he had a white collar and white tie. Hiram was a little bit more current with the times. So he had the collar down under his chin, and he has a dark tie. Why is that important? I'll tell you later. Okay? And the same same thing here. As, well, these are temple clothes, and so everything was white. So how did he make the uh, profiles? Um since the 1700s or even before, artists would use a, a tracing technique like this. They would have a person sit in front of a canvas or a piece of paper or something and have a lit candle and it would shine a shadow and then they were able to uh, very accurately make a profile of that person. You can't do it looking straight on because you don't really get any features. So it has to be a profile. And so they believe that it was this type of profile method that uh, Sutcliffe, Sutcliffe Mosley had made his drawings of Joseph and Hiram and all these other people. Now, the other thing is that there are desk masks available of Joseph and Hiram. And here's the ones that are shown in Salt Lake City. In my other video, I go into great detail talking about there can be inaccuracies with the death mask, uh, the way they're created and the way they were, uh, maybe the bodies were or were not prepared uh, to show the desk mask correctly and the features correctly. And the fact that Joseph and Hiram were pretty much beaten up. And so their faces were, were swollen and distorted a little bit. This is this will come into play later, but they I don't rely too much on a death mask. And I'll, and I'll show you why later. Okay, so now let's go back to the photos of Joseph. There are many possible photos of Joseph, especially ever since the internet was born, right? And so everybody's searching for trying to find a photo of Joseph. And so there are many of these things available. This is this one and this one and, um, and, and many others. I'm just going to show a few here. And so they certainly could have possibilities of Joseph. They could look like Joseph. It might be him. Okay. And this one, well, my heart skipped the beat when I saw this one because it's the same nose, the same eyes, the same mouth, the hair, the proportions. Everything is exactly Joseph. I thought, oh my gosh, it's Joseph, right? Mm, no. Unfortunately, this is Senator Hugh Ho Alexander Hugh Holmes Stewart from Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, a portrait that was taken of him about the same time period, probably late 1840s. And then here's an engraving of him much older to kind of prove that it is Senator uh, Stewart. So that's not him. Now, have you seen this picture? Okay, everybody said, oh, is this, maybe this is Joseph. Well, let's check it out. Okay, so we look at uh, the, the very accurate drawing uh, profile that um, Sutcliffe Mosley made, and then compare it to the, the photograph of, of, of possibly Joseph. And in general, the lines seem to match up. Okay, you got the top of the forehead and nose and mouth and so on. Okay, that checks. And then the uh, comparing to the death mask, these lines also match up. And so one would think, well, well, this is it, right? And plus, the daguerreotype itself, was a small little round one, was in the Smith family for generations. So it has a really good uh, pedigree. But there are other characteristics that need to be included in the comparison between the two, okay? So 
looking after this daguerreotype, notice that there are furrows in his forehead, and his eyebrows have they're kind of thick towards the middle, and then they get really thin, and they kind of droop down, kind of a sad look to his his, his eyebrows and eyes, and his eyes are themselves are, are sunken in. They're you can see they're small and sunken in, and he has um, the shape of the nose is is hard to tell. But he has sunken cheeks, and you can see that quite clearly. And the other thing is he has these lines, creases around his mouth, um, like a lot, of, a lot of men do, okay? It's had deep creases around his mouth. Now, when we look at the photo of Joseph and also the death mask, but Joseph has, and you can see this really clearly on the death mask, no lines on his forehead. He, no worry lines, no frown lines. It's just totally smooth. And he has full eyebrows. They don't droop down, they go straight across, and they're quite thick. And he does not have sunken in the eyes. His eyes are kind of uh, large and rounded. And he does not have sunken cheeks. He has full cheeks. And you can see that from the shading. And then uh, there are no creases around his, his mouth and on his chin. Okay? So when I compare these two, I'm saying that it's not Joseph. However, let's look at this again. Let's look at both Hiram and Joseph together. Now, Hiram and Joseph were complete brothers, but they were very different in the far as their appearance. Hiram was tall and thin, a little taller than Joseph by about an inch, had a different nose, different face, different everything. And Joseph uh, was, as you can see there, and Hiram had... Um, a worry lines on his forehead, according to the drawing here. You can see it quite clearly. He also had short, sloping eyebrows, which gave him a sort of a tired look. And deep-set eyes. Now, the artist made the eyes look a little too big, but uh, they were deep-set eyes. And he had this shape of the nose with a bump on the top. Plus, he had sunken cheeks, and he had creases in his cheeks around his mouth. So when you compare the death mask of Hiram, now looking at that, and I put some charcoal lines to kind of accentuate the, the areas so you can see it a little clearer, but he has worry lines on his forehead. This is the death mask. Worry lines on his forehead, short, sloping eyebrows, giving a kind of a tired look. He had deep set eyes, and the shape of the nose, you can see here with a little bump on it, and he had sunken cheeks and creases in his mouth around in his mouth and, and chin. You see that there? So instead of Joseph, I think that this picture is a picture of Hiram. The one and only photo of Hiram, because it matches perfectly, just perfectly. Okay, so has the same forehead, has the same eyes, eyebrows, same, same sunken cheeks, has the same uh, creases around his, his mouth and so on and so forth. And looking uh, straight on with the death mask, all these things line up really well, really well, better than, than matching up to the one of Joseph. And then, um, let's see, so this is, so I think this is Hiram. Now, I decided that, and by the way, the first time I saw this photo, I thought, and they said, oh, this is Joseph. I looked at that, ah, it's not Joseph. And then the second thing that I thought of was like, Kind of looks like Hiram. And, well, I think it is. And so I made, just for fun, I made a 3D rendering of based on that daguerreotype. And I even put it in motion for you. Very different face from Joseph. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's Hiram. So, in my quest to find Joseph, I accidentally found Hiram. So, what about Joseph? Okay, so what characteristics did Joseph have? All right. Now, this is a painting that's in the mansion house um, that is um, been there for uh, assumed to be painted by somebody by the name of David Rogers. In 1842 or 43 or 44 or something, and then 
but that's never been proven because there's no signature. And the other artwork that's done by David Rogers doesn't match this at all. It's just a totally different style. And so the theory is, or the thought is, that this was uh, painted from life of Joseph Smith. And so uh, we're going to dive into that. So as an artist, I have painted from life, and I've also painted from photos. And when you paint from life, well, here's one painted. These are all painted from photos. You know, I take the photo and I would, you know, create the painting and so on and so forth. And there are some different characteristics between painting from life, like this one that I did, and some painting from a uh, photograph. And the differences are that when you're painting from a live model, like this one on the left, you've got to be fast. And the brush strokes that you put down are they're they're quick and they you just put them down and hopefully you get it right. And you there's a limited time to do this because the light changes, the model moves, and so on and so forth. I can't hold the pose. And you'll never get the creases in the in the uh, clothing the same. It'll always be different. So it's really kind of frustrating. But when you paint from life, I mean from a photo, then um, the sun never moves. The model never moves. The clothing is always the same. And it has a lot of detail that you can take your time with. And you can get all these little pearls on the necklaces and you can get all the fingers and everything just exactly right, the fingernails and so on and so forth. You can put a lot of time into a little too much time. And it's because it's tempting to paint everything you see. You can't do that with life. It's got to be quick and it's got to be fast. I mean, you know, as far as accurate, as far as doing this uh, painting. So the um, so the if you hear some close ups of the two. So the the one on the left um, is uh, kind of a sketchy style. And the one on the right, I put a lot of detail in, especially with the eyes and so on and so forth. And uh, so it looks a more polished, finished look to it. Now, here is a painting by John Singer Sargent, a painter that lived in the 18, late 1890s, that type of thing. And his paintings are beautiful. And as a portrait artist, John Singer Sargent knew how to compose his subject, knew what to do with the lighting. And so the lighting in the, uh, uh, on the face, the, the main light here is off this way, looking, pointing down. And it gives a really nice shadow from the nose. And also puts the uh, the little highlight in the eyes in the eleven o'clock or one o'clock position, and that's that's where you want to be as a as a portrait artist. And it's very flattering to the sitter. Now, when we look at the painting of Joseph here, the light is coming straight down um, and making giving us this kind of funny little shadow under his nose, and the highlights on the eyes are pretty much right straight up from from the uh, from the iris. So this is a very unflattering pose. It's not one that a trained artist would use. So it breaks the rules for fine art portraiture. But if you're a photographer and you weren't really trained in portraiture, this is probably exactly what you would do. Now, let's look a little further. There's the nose. So there's photos. These photos here were said to be a photo of the painting, OK? And they're all a little different. Uh, this is one here by Charles Carter, uh, Library of Congress, and also the other one there is Library of Congress photos. And they all have um, a similarity to them, but they all have these white out, white out backgrounds. How come they're white? Why don't if they're a photo of the painting? Where's you know where's the background of the painting? There was like a little scene back there. It was real dark. Why in the world is there white? And how do they do the white? Well, you can't do that on a daguerreotype. It's impossible. And so what you have to do, and I've worked in a dark room and a Photoshop years ago as a kid. And so I've developed all kinds of photos and, and uh, learned a lot of techniques and stuff. And one of the things I learned in the Photoshop is that you can take and restore an old photo. You can take a photo like this, and if you put, and you take a photo, a picture of the photo, and you, with the negative, you can, you can um, white out or black out the, the background and make it nice and clean, right? And then when it's done, when you print the thing, now it's a nice white background. The problem is that with the India ink, it's, it's kind of hard to, you know, keep the line straight. There was no such thing as Photoshop. 
You couldn't do anything like this with uh, uh, with uh, watercolor, especially not on the daguerreotype. It had to be years later after the uh, other photos were created that had you know negatives and paper prints and so on. So now I want to introduce you to, you saw the first three photos. So this is a fourth one. This is photo number four, supposedly of the painting, okay? This is a recently discovered photo by a lady by the name of Kim Marshall. And this photo was given to her by her grandmother. It's just a really small little photo. But this photo is extremely intriguing because this one does not have a whited out background. The background is the original background. And you can tell it is because the fuzziness around here, okay? And that is probably why the others wanted to clean this thing up because it's like, oh, it's so fuzzy. Let's let's make it nice and straight line, straight, 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 straight. And so it doesn't look so bad. And also get rid of the imperfections of the background. And the other thing is, I'm gonna make it my clicker going here. So it has the original background and it has the original edges. And it's the only photograph that shows the top of the hand the cuff and the sleeve and a little bit of the hand. Okay, that's as far down as the photo goes. This is really important because, um, all right, well, let's just kind of go on. Um, why, uh, let's, let's move on here. Whoops, I got the wrong button. Okay, so let's compare Kim Marshall's photo with the painting of, of Joseph. All right, so yeah, they look like they match up. There's the sleeve and so on and so forth, and there's the painting. Now, it is my belief that this is not a photo of the painting, but that this is a painting of the photo, okay? That the artist used this photo, or one like it, as reference, the daguerreotype, as, as reference for the painting, and I will show you why, okay? <laughs> so first off that hand that hand is always a bug the heck out of me and so it's just hanging there now when photographers would do portraits of, of people in the day and even later they would put something in their hand they put like a book a writing whip um, all these various little props a cane something in the hand to bring the hand up into the photo okay because it was, it was a nice composition well there's nothing in his hand and his hand is sort of just kind of dangling there like this. And it's, even though the, the, the face and everything is great, it's like, why did he make this kind of like a bear claw hand with the fingers, you know, the same, it's not curled or, you know, whatever, it's just hanging there. So like, okay, well, that's weird. So um, why was that? And then the other thing is that sleeve has always bugged the heck out of me. There's no such coat and, and cuff that looks like that. Um, this is not the way cuffs look like in the 1840s or even since. So the top of the cuff, okay, there it is, top of the cuff, top of the cuff. And then he goes woo down like this. It's like, that's not how shirt sleeves look. In fact, here is a picture of a shirt sleeve cuff. And this is what they looked like in the 1840s. They had the button and buttonhole right there at the edge so that you could uh, roll up your cuff and make it easier to you know, keep your uh, hands clean or cuffs clean. And so what it should have looked like <coughs> is that. That's the way cuffs and coat sleeves look. Now, why didn't he paint it that way? I mean, that is so strange. Nobody had a sleeve that looked like this. So those two things are bugging me for a long time. Okay, so. Um, if this is a painting of the photo, well, how did he get it so accurate? How is it so just really just perfect, except for the hand? Okay. There is a process called, or uh, there's a little thing called the uh, camera lucida, where you look through a little prism and you can see your drawing surface here and the thing that you're drawing over there, and you basically just trace it. This was patented in 1806, decades before the uh the joseph died and so on okay we're gonna go a little bit more we're gonna talk about white ties now this may seem really minuscule but it all seems to fit together really well 
These are some early daguerreotypes of ministers back in the end of the day, in the 1840s. And as a minister, you, you identified yourself as a minister by wearing a white tie. And so it's this, it's the forerunner of today's uh, ministers where they have like a little white collar, you know? The same, it's the same thing. It kind of evolved into that. But ministers of the day wore white ties. And when we look at the pictures of Joseph here, he's wearing a white tie. And, and Hiram's wearing a, a dark tie. Now, on all these photos of Joseph, supposedly, nobody's wearing a white tie. Small detail, I have to admit. But it all kind of seems to fit together. Hold on, hang on with me here. So, as documented in Mosley's drawings, Joseph always wore a high white collar and a white tie. And from what I understand is that Emma wouldn't have it any other way. She, he wasn't really keen on wearing the, the white ties, but Emma made him do it because he's a minister. Now, I want to dig into a really interesting facet here. And I call this the eyes habit. So there's, here's a close-up of the painting, and here's a close-up of the photograph, the daguerreotype. There's a photo of the daguerreotype. Okay, now I changed, I went into Photoshop and I, well, let's, let's first, I, I want to show you this. See the um, light part of the eye here? The shine in the iris? Where is it? I don't see it on the painting. And, and see how the, the light spot here and here? They're a heck of a lot smaller up here. Than they, are, than they are down here. I went into Photoshop and made this thing black and white, so it kind of compared more apples to apples, right? And so I adjusted the values and contrast and stuff to make it look as close as possible as I could make to the photograph, and it still does not look like the photograph. The photograph has much more detail and much different detail in the photo than it does in the um, painting. And Again, there's a little white spot. It's like much smaller on the painting. And the um, lit iris on the bottom, the shine in the iris, is there on the photo, but not on the painting. Okay. And then, again, the, the, uh, the size of the, the dot. And then if you line up all the various lines and stuff, you did a really good job on this painting, but some things don't match up. The blue lines match up, but the red ones don't. And so the size of the whole iris is a little too big and a little off and so on and so forth. If this is a picture of the painting, how can that be? How can there be differences? It should be exactly the same, right? You can't take a picture of a painting and have it look completely different. And the, the detail is, is so strong on those eyes. And I also heard once that Emma hated that painting, just hated it. And I can understand why, because if, if Joseph's face looked like this, and she was, you know, the painter painted something that looked like that, like big, dark owl eyes with a crease between his, his eyebrows, by the way, which Joseph did not have at all. Um, yeah, I can understand why she didn't like it. So that is the photos of the, uh, the painting. And there's a couple other quickie things. Fabric detail. Okay, so this is Karma uh, Anderson, a, a professor at BYU that had uh, uh, costuming classes, which I took. And Karma was a uh, quite a stickler for uh, truth and accuracy and stuff. And so um, taking her costume classes, I could understand and know exactly how to make, uh, uh, you know, costumes, fabric, and, uh, and clothing for the 1840s. And so... Um, I was enrolled in her class a couple of times and, and, and found some really, really good items from, from her teachings. So years afterwards, I got a phone call from Karma, and she said that she was shown a picture at BYU of a close-up of one of these photos of Joseph, where they had zoomed in, I think it was some powerful microscope or something, and they were able to see fabric lines in the clothing. You know, now you can't do that in a painting. You can't paint, you know, the, the fabric uh, detail stuff. I asked Karma, what picture was it? And she said, the one with the crazy hair. 
And it's only looked crazy because they cropped it out and, and made it look funny. And there's some of these other ones that look uh, even worse than that. So here's uh, a uh, detail that I got from a man by the name of um, um, Simons, Simonson, where it you can't see in this photo because it's a really bad photo, but they were able to zoom in on this and able to see that the, the grain of the fabric was actually in, in the photograph. It's like, well, you can't do that in a painting. It's impossible. I don't care who you are or how detailed you are. It's not possible. Now, there's other things, too, that led me to this conclusion, and that is photographic distortions. So here are the four pictures of supposedly a picture of the painting, okay? And they're all really similar, but they're all a little bit different, too. The, not only the shape of the hair, but they kind of skewed a little bit. Why is that? Why aren't they just exactly the same? That is because taking a photograph of a daguerreotype is tricky. It is really hard because you, if you look at it straight on, it, it, it's, it's a negative. And you have to kind of tilt it a little bit and get it just right. Because otherwise, you see, either see yourself or you see a negative image. And, and so they have to skew the photograph. Now, in today's modern era, they can, they can just shoot them just right on. They got the right cameras and the right lighting and so on and so forth. But years ago, it's hard. Now, here is a daguerreotype. And you can see that you hold it that way, it's good. And if you tilt it the wrong way, it turns into a negative. Because the dark areas are um, transparent and the light areas are uh, shiny. And so um, you have to hold it just right. That is why those things are so um, different. Now, just a couple more things. When I adjust Kim Marshall's photo, so that it matches just perfectly, and it does, with the painting. You have the lines with the eyes and so on and so forth. Everything is perfect, except for one thing. And that is that hand. <laughs> okay, so the hand on the painting starts, at the cuff starts here, but on the photograph, it goes up over there. How can that be? If this is, if this is a photo of a painting, how could you have... The hand all of a sudden dropped down while everything else is exactly the same up here. Okay, it's see the difference between the two now. If and also where the vest lands, the very point of the vest, the opening uh, here is right there, but over on the photo, it's much higher. And by the way, this is a common device for artists. They, if they make the head um, smaller or the body bigger. It, it gives them a more of a larger manly look, you know, instead of uh, instead of actually how it was. And so I don't I don't see this as a as a problem at all with the artist. He knew exactly what he's doing. So now, if we stretch out that photo so the eyes and the cuff match just perfectly, well, now nothing else matches. Okay, the the cuff matches there, but now the vest is in the wrong spot and the mouth is in the wrong spot, chin's in the wrong spot. And so it isn't just simply a, a matter of having it stretched. It is, it is wrong. Now we put it back in the right spot and it all lines up, but not down here. There's the difference. Ah, misaligned photo. So oh, so you're a photographer. You're going to take a picture of a person. And so you you get your person sitting there, and they've got their hand up on a book or something. And then what happened up here? Why is there so much room up at the top? There's an enormous amount of room. And, and why did it get cut off on the bottom? Well, I have a theory on that. And um, so a whole lot of room up on top and not room on the bottom. OK, it should have looked like this. But for some reason, it looked like that. And this kind of perplexed me for a long time. Why in the world did the photographer move the camera down or whatever it was so that you only see a whole bunch of headspace and, and cut off the whole hand? Well, in a daguerreotype camera, this is the way it works. Here's your subject, here's your camera, and the picture gets taken and gets taken on this little silver plate that's over there in the uh, in the camera part. The little plate is only secured by a couple of rails and it has a tendency to slip. And originally, I think, 
was much higher and it would have covered his hand and uh, not given so much headspace. And here's how that would happen. And where, where I think, this is all theory here. So here's the camera. And when you do the camera, you line it up just exactly right. And when you're done, you put in this uh, camera film holder. And then when you put the film holder in, you hope that nothing happened to, the, uh, to your image, right? Maybe the tripod didn't slip or various things. But I think that when you put in the film holder, that this image slipped like that. And so because the image is upside down, the plate would have slipped down, revealing a, a lot more headspace and cutting off the hands. That's my theory. And so it wasn't securely fastened. So here it is, and hopefully this little video will play. This is the last thing.
If you've never held a daguerreotype, uh, here is one that I found on the internet. And um, it's very, very uh, a good photo of some unknown person, but uh, they're dressed very similar to what Joseph Hout would have dressed. And here's the little case. The, the, this part was missing, so I, I created a new one. But when you look at it, you'll see that it's, it's a native until you hit it just exactly right. And then all of a sudden you see that image appear. And they're really fun. And these the daguerreotypes lasted, I mean, this was the photo for a couple of decades. And then the process was approved upon and approved upon and approved upon over and over through the years until we, we get, the, you know, cameras on our phones. And so, and by the way, so a camera on your phone has uh, 70, has uh, 13 megapixels. Pretty good, right? So the megapixel equivalent on a daguerreotype according to Kodak scientists, is 144,000 megapixels. There was no grain, and it was just, the grain was as infinite as the atoms on the, on the silver plate. Yeah. It had a nicely focused uh, picture. You could just look deep into the thing. It was it was that accurate. We have nothing like that. Which is why you can see the fabric, the fabric lines. lines. <laughs> Say again? Yeah, which is why you can see the fabric lines. Yes, yes, exactly so. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate it.